How are you? I'm doing very well. Sorry about that. that not was the best. Yes, I know. I'm yeah. very well. And he's nabbed the best season. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's the right Late liberty. Late in pole position. That's very right. good. Yeah. Pole position, yes. But yes. as Lewis has proved, that doesn't mean you say you win. No, does it does not. No, 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 no. We. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyway, um, lots to go through. Yeah. Uh, we'll get uh, we'll get cracking. The lights have gone off. Let's get moving. And like all good stories, and this is a good story, we'll begin at the beginning. And uh, most Formula One drivers, as we know either have a dad who was an ex-world champion or a Jeez. billionaire. They're certainly not uh, boys from Essex, <laughs> um, with respect to anybody here from Essex, by the way. Um, so how did that begin? How did your love affair with motorsport uh, begin? What got the juices going? Uh, holiday down in Cornwall. Uh, I used to go down there every year with the, with the family. And it, weirdly, I don't know how it came together, but my uncle, and my aunt used to run the local go-kart track that was down there. Uh, so it was just an air fight. It was just outside St. Ives. And so when we went down there, we had these little sort of butlins, little cabin things that we used to go in. And then about 10 minutes away was this old World War II airfield. A the tires sort of wrapped around it, and that was the track, and he was running the car. So I got taken there, and I just basically just thrashed around all day long. And I used to beat all comers. So that was that very, very start. I'd done football at school, but I wasn't particularly good. I was, I've, I've always been very shy. Motorsport has helped me sort of come out, but I was the, the guy on the pitch going, can I have the ball? <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't, no, okay, no, it's okay. No, it's not a problem at all. So when I came into motorsport and karting, it was just something that just seemed to be easy and I was good at, and I didn't even have to think about it. I used to just get in it, they'd start it up, and I just thrash around and I was sliding it around and all that natural thing you sort of hear is exactly when you see that. It's the first time someone gets into a, a, a playing golf. I remember seeing Tiger Woods on TV, Johnny Carson show I think it was, and he was only about that high and he swings this damn club. It's unbelievable what he does and karting was a similar type of experience for me. And that's the first thing to point out I guess. We all think we're good drivers but um, for some reason we, we can't relate so much to maybe a footballer who can kick a ball and is clearly talented. There's a natural talent there, isn't there, as, as a driver, which, which makes racing drivers different from the rest of us. I, th I think that's a, a thing in general sports, to be perfectly honest. But in, in, uh, in, in motorsport, there's, there's a lot of good guys, there's a lot of very good guys, and there's not many elite drivers. And those elite drivers are the guys that do get to Formula One, but they're the ones who actually win the World Championships. There are, as I said, very, very good guys who are always there but they never quite achieve it because they haven't quite got that little extra seventh sense that you need to be able to sort of just absorb everything that's going on in front of you as far as you, when you're driving. And, I've, and when I was driving, it was all about the visual effect that I was getting. Braking was only done by the speed the corner came to me. And I thought I was sort of, uh, sort of a bit rare, but I spoke to Lewis about a couple of years ago, and it's exactly the same with him. So what, what do you, when you go into cops, what do you, what do you notice? And he says, don't notice anything. I don't look at anything. It's just, it's just there, and that is just that sort of little unique thing that you need as a driver. If you start to think about it, then that's when you're sort of not as quick as the guys at the front. Talking about the guys at the front, can you all hear at the back? If not, say so. You can't. It's a, I mean, he's oh, very a shy. I'm very. He's quiet. very shy and retiring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Johnny. I'll shout. Johnny, would you would you speak up? Please? I'll speak up. Can I'll you hear us now? Well. I'll face you, the other yeah, way. All good. Is okay. that okay? No problem at all. James Hunt, Nicky Lauda. Yeah. That's what got you going as well, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, again, that you you go to watch that sort of year that they battled together. Of course, Nicky went through his his crash, but of course later it was James who sort of took the title by by that half a point. But it was the the way that these guys were able to just move those cars around. And the, the biggest thing that I've always enjoyed, if it was karting or Formula Four or Formula Three or whatever it may be. It's the racing part. It's the, it's the ability to sort of outfox if you're trying to pass someone, outfox them. And then if you're in front, it's how you make it difficult for them to overtake. And those two in that year were just at it, sort of tooth and now. And that's part of what racing is all about. And that's what I want to still see today, now seeing it from the other side of the, uh, of the cockpit. And it's that um, ability for, or it was that ability for me to sort of try and replicate that. And it, but again, it was when I was karting, which was, which was done by, by a few, 
Um, when I got into Formula One, Brundle, he'd never done karting. Damon had never done karting, bastard for winning the 96 World Championship. <laughs> and uh, Mark, uh, Mark Blundell, you know, he did, he did motocross. So they had a different experience. And all, every single guy now on the grid is a karter. And the karting just gives you that extra race skill that we want to see from what they were doing when they were sort of eight, eight, ten years old. And we want to see that on the racetrack as well. So what sort of, yeah, James and Nicky did, and especially Nicky coming back from what he had to come back to and then still win world championships a little bit later on. Just brilliant stuff. It really got sort of the hairs on the back of my neck. You so I'm I mean? getting a theme here. Uh, you get two sorts of racing drivers. Mm. You get drivers and you get racers. Yeah. And you're in the latter category, aren't you? The, the other hero as a, as a kid growing up was, was the great Gilles Villeneuve. Yeah. For the same reason? Well, slightly different reason because, yes, as far as sort of um, speed, that was something that he sort of had in abundance. But the, the, the best thing that I loved about him was, and I think it was Zanvor, I remember, he got a, I think he'd spun off, he got a puncture when he spun off, and then he tried to get back to the pits. And you see it sort of nowadays, they sort of creep back and they just go around the corner, be very careful, the tyre doesn't sort of... Uh, d come off of the rim and damage the body. Well, he went up full pelt and just flew around the car like this, the tyres unwrapping, and then it smashed in the side of the bodywork. And it was that type of driving that I thought was, was brilliant because you would, you would normally just poodle around, as I said before, but Gilles had this special feel for what he needed to do in a race car. And it, the driving, pure driving skill I always saw in him was something I tried to, I almost tried to replicate because that was just what I think. It was driving on the edge, which he did. It's very sad when we, when we lost him in, in Zolder. But that is something that is, it's a massive buzz when you're driving in the car. Driving on that, right on that very, very edge. And then the satisfaction that comes with it. And that, that's something that Gilles showed in abundance, as I said. Well, uh, in the sort of mid to late 80s, uh, Johnny moved up the, the categories and was absolutely uh, seen to be... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're just dressing around too we're, much. <laughs> we're, just, we're just dressing Johnny here. <laughs> right? Thank you. Sorry. Just <laughs> yeah. No problem at all. You're flying someone done as well, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, we'll, we'll carry on. Uh, Johnny, was, uh, Johnny was seen to be one of, I mean, one of the... the, the the, the names that everybody was talking about. I'll, I'll spare your blushes. You were. Um, he was uh, right, later. <laughs> um, and, and he was absolutely one of the, the big names t to look out for. And you, you were winning most things. Um, and uh, really a huge, huge future beckoned. I say past tense because it, you went on to fulfil a huge future. Mm. But it was looking very, very good, wasn't it? Until, and we'll get... Unfortunately, the nasty bit is fairly early on in the career, so we'll get it over and done with. Yeah. Uh, we come to 1988. You're, you're, you're almost touching, you're almost feeling, you're almost tasting Formula One by then, aren't you? Yeah. And we come to a Formula 3000 race at Brands Hatch, which, which changes your life. Yeah, well, well, I tasted it before because I did my first test in, uh, at Brands Hatch in 87 when I was doing Formula 3. So, you know, I'd got together with that uh, uh, wiggy bloke, uh, Eddie Jordan, and <laughs> Wait a are you saying he wears a wig? Oh yes. There we go. <laughs> oh yes, indeed. This goes no further. <laughs> this goes no further. No, no, no. Spread it. <laughs> Spread it. A little no. bit like his hair. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Gets it done in Birmingham. This by is the a way. serious. This is oh, supposed to be a serious, serious sorry. moment. Sorry, yes. sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, right. Anyway, so uh, so when I got together with Wiggy, uh, uh, Eddie, it was it was a very important part for for Eddie, and it was a very important part for me because. The jump from Formula Ford is, is a fairly large sort of jump, and especially in, in, the, in your career, because Formula 3 is sort of looked upon from, from uh, the Formula 1 uh, side of things. And there was always the race in Monaco that you did, which I finished third, which was, which was good during that year. So anyway, so when I got together with Eddie, he was always trying to get the right driver that would give him the chance to get to Formula 1. That was always his dream. So. He was an ex-driver, wasn't actually bad at driving to be perfectly honest, but it just never quite materialised. He actually wasn't good enough. <laughs> but, um, but when he became a, t a team owner, and I, I'd done a couple of Formula 3 races in, in, uh, in 86, and we, we came to London, it was the, uh, like the Autosport 
awards and uh, we were sitting on on two different tables and we were back to back on each other and he basically leaned back and said have you signed for for Glen Waters and Autosport which is who Damon and Martin uh, Donnelly drove for in 87 I said no no I haven't spoken to anybody yet and it was like five minutes back of a napkin on the table an agreement was done and so what happened with me winning the the championship in 87 was just the synergy in that click that we both had and how we fed, fed off each other. I needed him and he needed me and then we were able to sort of go through that sort of that journey of, of, of Formula 3 and then of course the test I had in, in Benetton at Brands Hatch which went very very well. I was also then testing uh, for the final three which was Stefano, Modena, Alessandro Nanini and myself for the 88 season and did a really, really good job, but they chose Alessandro Nini, which is a quite understandable. He's already driven for Minardi at that point. So, so the journey then, yes, goes to winning the 4 3 championship. Now we've got to go and do Formula 3000. But my uh, sparky father didn't have enough cash, obviously. So Eddie didn't really have enough sponsorship either. We got the chassis from, from Reynards themselves because it was their first jump into, into 3000. The engines came from Alex Hawkridge, who was at Tolman in the Formula One team, and Tolman as in the transport company. Um, and we had one little sticker on the side of the car, which was an insurance company, Clowers, which they actually spot, um, uh, insurance to a lot of drivers even today. So, and this is where, again, Eddie's uh, such a smart, a smart little cookie. So we went to, to Hareth, we, we got pole position. Um, he phoned up Duncan Lee, who was the head of Camel, uh, at that time, we were just sort of really coming into into motorsport, mainly in Formula One, and there was a little P P Pierre Luigi Martini was once well them anyway. So got pole position. He phoned up Duncan. He said, "You know, Duncan got this guy, Johnny Herbert. He is the next big thing. You, you've got to be a part of this. You've got to really, get, you know, join us." He said, I, "I can't do anything, Eddie. I've already put out the the sponsorship to the teams. We don't have any budget anymore." He said, "No, no, no, no. You don't. You just don't understand. This guy is the next big thing. He's got pole position." You know, we've, you've got to do something. He said, Look, Eddie, I can't do anything. He said, okay, all right, let's have a meeting on Tuesday. Tuesday next week, have a meeting. Eddie, Eddie, I cannot do anything. No, 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 no. You've so he went on, 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 on. And he went, okay, 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 okay. Yes, you can have the meeting on Tuesday. So then he went, and this was probably about 10 o'clock at night on Saturday night. He went to Pierre Luigi's uh, team, I can't remember their name. And he said, have you got a camel sticker, like the, what, a truck sticker? And they said, yeah, 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 can I have that? Yeah, 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 can I just, can I borrow it? I'll borrow a sticker. You borrow a sticker. <laughs> so, so he got the sticker, cut it out, put it on the side of the side pods. Uh, for Sunday, we we did the race with the sticker on it. I won the race. He had the meeting on Tuesday. He got the budget. Okay. So that was the shrewd Eddie Jordan. So it, again, I worked for him and he worked for me. Yeah. Can you hear? By the way, still he's still struggling a bit. Be honest. A bit quiet. Him or me? Him. I'll try him. and stand. Yeah. No, I can't see. No, you won't be able to see me. No, I can't see that exactly. Like yeah. <laughs> Just speak up I'll a try bit again. More. I know. I do. You use your voice like an I'm opera singer. I'm tired. Yeah. Okay. okay. Go on then. Sorry. So do we you get got, to have you got the gist of it. We we, we yeah. get we got to, the gist um, of it. Okay. I will try now. We get to we get the brands hatch. We we need to get into because there's a lot to talk about. Yes, tonight. I know there is. Yes. We we need to unfortunately get to uh, get to brands hatch. And if you don't mind, just for a couple of minutes, uh, reliving. Yeah. That's uh, rather. Awkward moments. Well, I'm going to I'm going to do a brief one the week before because okay. it's important how the journey was all going. I did a test for Lotus in uh, Monza, which was uh, Nakajima and PK, and Peter Wall was sort of quite interested. Already had an option with Benetton anyway, but Peter Wall was very very interested. So they asked Benetton, can he test the car? Yes, okay. Went to Monza, started testing, going around to the old turbos, which was lovely a lovely experience. So I'm glad I did. Never race one. So went round, uh, we were trying a few different things on the car. Nelson was in the other car, I was going quicker than Nelson. So everybody sort of pretty much sort of uh, shocked that that's happening. But at the end of that test, of course, everybody then is aware of me even more than they were uh, after doing the first test at Brands Hatch. But as I'm leaving, the PA to Enzo Ferrari came up to me and sort of said, Enzo wants to, wants to meet you next week uh, or the week after. So to me, that's just, Brilliant! I've got Peter War, I've got Lotus, I've got Benetton, and now I've got Enzo Ferrari who wants to, who wants to get to, get together with with me. So, I leave uh, Monza for Brands, uh, get to Brands, and I always explain it's like a like a, a ball. I was on top of this ball, and every time I sort of it won a championship or did well in a test, the ball just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So after Enzo had done his little bit, my ball went as, as big as it 
could get. So I could be, and I believed it, that I could be anybody, anywhere, any car, any condition. So I go to Brands, pumped up uh, massively. Everything's going, des I'm, I mean, I'm destined to be in Formula One with, with someone. Um, so we, we get into qualifying, do a brilliant job in qualifying quite comfortably on pole position. And on Sunday morning, as I'm walking into the, the pit lane, Frank is coming down the other way and he stops me and says, Johnny, I want to speak to you after the race. It's Frank Williams, yeah? It's Frank Williams. So I've got Frank Williams now after me at the same time. <laughs> so I'm strutting my <laughs> stuff down, down the pit lane. And there's a, there is a picture that I've, I've seen where I, I just look so relaxed and confident and Essex cocky as well <laughs> at the same time. So we, we do the first part of the race. Good start. I'm about 12, second ahead, 12 seconds ahead. Gregor Wojtek has a coming together with Roberto Moreno, who was always involved with something. I'd had a crash earlier in the year with him where he put me off the circuit. I head-butted the, the crash barrier. Uh, I walked back down the bank, across the track, over the other bank, into the um, uh, medical centre, and they always do sort of a urine sample. And I woke, I actually come, come when I'm actually doing that in, in the, in the, uh, for, for the urine side. Still can't remember walking across the track. So it was something, and I missed Poe. I went to Silverstone and everything was a little bit, so I was concussed and it never really came together. Anyway, so we do the, uh, uh, the first part, 12 seconds, great. Stop the race, still feeling okay. The, the Essex cockiness came out when we did the parade lap. And in Brands, if you know, the, the pole position's down in a little bit of a dip. So I've done okay on the first one. So I thought, well, I'll just park it slightly up. Because I think if I get a good start, it will just sort of be dead straight and I'll get a real proper launch, a better launch than I got in the first one. But of course, it's sort of a little bit about two wheel spin. It goes down in the dip as we do the start. And then I think Martin got in front, uh, Pierre Luigi got in front. And then I'm side by side with, with Vitek still, because he's still in the race at that point. So we go round paddock, we go down up towards Druids. I think we're side by side. I can't remember which side who was on, but we bang wheels as we go around Druids. Not too concerned because I was in front as we went down towards Graham Hill, got to Surtees, went onto the Grand Prix circuit. I looked in my mirror, I could see that he looked as if he had a good drive. I thought I had a good drive, but he looked as if he had a slightly better drive than I did. And as we're going uh, towards the, the bridge, I can see he's gone left. And I thought, well, I'll just place it in the middle of the track because that's it's very hard to go either left or either, either right. And I thought well, he's gonna have to probably go on the grass on the left side, but I'll just stay, stay in my line. And I just keep watching him all the time. And as it gets closer, there's just a little nudge. And when the nudge comes, it just turns left. And then I always remember thinking, oh my. But I never even got that far. It was just up and it was just bang. And I just remember it coming up. Because unfortunately the barrier normally on a, like a, a racetrack goes straight just down and up to Hawthorne and around the corner. But where the bridges and the earth bank is, the barrier goes round the bank so where it comes out that's where I just went basically head on and I didn't hit between the girders where it would be a little bit softer I actually hit the girder which knocked it I think about 90 degrees sort of the other side and of course that's where the front of the car got broken off and I remember it spinning around and it's all quite quiet it's really weird it was very silent in the car itself you know the actual initial impact it was silent so anyway spin across <coughs> and I remember going in and head on and of course my feet hanging out to the front of the car anyway so I go head on it spins around and then it stops and then I remember opening my eyes and then seeing there was like a big hole I could sort of see the circuit going down towards hawthorne trees in the background birds flying by very pretty uh, but the first thought was I thought because I could only see the top of my knees so I thought from my knees down my legs had, had disappeared so I remember that's what, there's a picture in the book and it was where I've got the gas on and my head's back and I'm going knock me out 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 then a marshal came up and maybe I'm going, you okay? You okay? He said. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I saw, I wasn't really with it to be perfectly honest. Then I remember him walking around the front of the car and I remember him sort of going, <laughs> yeah, it's not good. It's not good. So that was again another sort of thing. This is, this is not, not looking good. And as the gas is going on, and I can't remember it as I'm telling you, but I know I did it is Adrian Radard came up and my, and my engineer. And that was where I sort of I said, uh, is a spare car ready? <laughs> oh. <laughs> and that was sort of how... The birth of Johnny the Joker. The birth of Johnny the Joker, yeah, literally, yes. And that was yeah. basically the, the situation then I was in. But I, di I still thought my you legs had gone. You lost your yeah. legs. So 
Um, the incredible thing about this is, is you were told, um, and your, your then girlfriend was told as well, wasn't it? We, we, we're probably going to have to amputate. Oh, my wife, yeah. Uh, your, what's, what's oh, now, 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 now girlfriend, she's your yeah. wife, yeah. We, we, we're probably going to have to amputate. Mm -hmm. uh, you're very lucky to be alive at all. Yeah. And as for your racing career, forget that. Yeah. The next season, you were racing for Benetton in F Formula One. Now, we haven't got all, all night, Johnny, but, but quite succinctly, if <laughs> you, you can. <laughs> if you can. Explain, hey, this explain, is about me. Explain, Not how about you you. Got, <laughs> explain how you got from a guy with your, your, your legs hanging off you yeah. to driving in a Formula One car. Um, I got a flight to Brazil and then I got right. in the car. <laughs> okay. A little bit right. more detail. Yeah. <laughs> right. The, the whole thing, of course, when I got to the hospital, I woke up for about 30 seconds. I remember my feet being up. The left one was bandaged up, but it was all red. So I remember that. But I do remember thinking, I've got my feet. So that's the first thing I did. Then I went into hospital after that. Then it was sort of the rehab. And I remember it initially being OK. Then it started to throb. Um, and then the pain really then started to sort of come from that point onwards. So then it was really thinking, right, what am I going to do? Because actually Birmingham was the next weekend. I watched it on TV. Gregor Wojtek was still racing, unfortunately. And because he does pisses me off. But anyway, <laughs> he, uh, so he was still racing. And I watched it. And I remember sort of laying there thinking, I still want to do it. I still think I can do this. They're there. They're on the end of my, on the end of my legs. So I reckon if I, I, have, I have two options. I think there's one which was I go away to Japan or somewhere and sort of get myself in as best condition as, as I can and then come back, here I am, I'm back again. But that one was sort of, I thought was a bit of a risky one. So the other one was, well, I will push myself as hard as I can. And if I do get there, then it's been worthwhile. If I don't, I tried my best. And that was sort of the mind, mind, mind thought that I had. But I was very, very lucky because when I was out of hospital in a wheelchair, legs still up like this because I couldn't walk on them because it was like plasticine, the way, I don't know what they call it, but if I would stood up on my left one it would have just completely collapsed, which, which was why I think it was November, end of November before I started walking again. Um, and the biggest thing was just saying, right, now how am I going to deal with this? But Peter Collins signed that contract which gave me something to aim for for 1989. So if it hadn't been for Peter, there would not have been a Johnny Herbert probably even sitting here because the career would never have been. So, a lot so that of pain, was important. A lot of pain, a lot of exercise. Yeah, in um, Austria, I got shipped off to Austria. Peter Collins knew uh, Kiki Rosberg and Nigel Mansell had actually been there with Tony Mattis who looked after me. And it was basically in Felkirk in, uh, in Austria, up in the mountains. He used to, I used to go swimming. Uh, generally in the morning he'd do a little bit of therapy, he had his little magic wand thing that he used to have and then I'd go into the forest, he'd take me into the forest and then he'd say right, you'd climb up there. So I'd go up to the top of this sort of mountain, which was about sort of 200 metres up, I'd come back down again. And on the first sort of ascent it was the feeling, because my toes are slightly sort of like this, so when I'm there I haven't got the suppleness that you've sort of got in your fingers or your, or your feet, it's all very rigid. So the toes are like that, and the first time I got up there, it was almost like someone had come with a pair of scissors and just snipped the tops off my nails because the pressure was just on the points, not on, on the pads or anything else. So the first time, it hurt like absolute merry hell, and I had to do that 10 times. And I had to do that every day, every, every day of the week, seven days a week, every single month, and it was, it's the most painful thing I've, I've ever done. And I hope I don't have to go through that again. I hope you don't have to go through that. But it had to be done. I couldn't say, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not, that's it, I give up. Because there was this Formula One that I'd got so close. And I thought, well, this ain't going to beat me. This is not going to stop me getting my dream. It's there, it's on a plate. I've been handed it by Peter Collins and Benetton. I'm going to make sure I get there. So through all that, pain and suffering that I went through, I got to Rio. First Grand Prix of the 1989 season in a Benetton car, uh, officially labelled as disabled, which you still are. I am. I've you are. I need to get my blue badge. You do need to get your... <laughs> I did have it once and then you I did. wrote it again, they refused it. Yeah, you might I don't believe of, that one. You could get one of those cars probably as the well. The car. Right? <laughs> right? First Grand Prix of the 89 season, fourth. How emotional was that? And perhaps you could also share the story about uh, 
Jean-Marie Balestre as well. I mean, that yeah. must have been very emotional, not just because you finished fourth in your first ever Grand Prix, but the journey that you had taken to get to that point. Yeah, well, the, the journey sort of started a month before because you used to go testing before you went to the Grand Prix itself. So we did that in Rio. Uh, there was a race distance that the team said, right, we want you to do this race distance now. I went, yeah, okay, no problem, that's okay. Um, so they filled it up in those, so you filled it right up with fuel and you did the sort of 79 laps or whatever it was in Rio. But they all pissed off to the, to the motorhome for cups of coffee and everything else. There was no one holding the ball out. They were betting how long I was going to last. 20 laps was the maximum that I think uh, that, uh, I had. And one, and one hour, 40 minutes later, I stopped on the track because I'd run out of fuel. <laughs> so I proved the point at that point. But then I got to Rio for the race itself, flew in. And I always remember getting to the, getting to the, the terminal at Heathrow. What gate is it? It's number 67, I think. Yeah, there we go, get there. We have to go via, via Felix, uh, Phoenix. How far is it? What gate is it? 174. And then when I got to Rio, to Rio, it was the gate that was the furthest away from the sort of the security. I got to the hotel. How far, you know, what room am I in? You're in 975. <laughs> it just seemed to be everything I did was just sort of fast. So this is before I even done the goddamn race. So got got to the track. Did uh, got through qualifying. Was out uh, out uh, qualified. Alessandro and Nini, I think 12th. I think I was something like that. But one thing that was what was important for that weekend was with this because this foot was like a I don't know, like a melon, small melon, but really, really sensitive inside, which it's sort of silly today. It's like it's raw inside. And on the, the, uh, the right-hander before you go, go on to the, the back straight, there was a huge bump. I mean, a huge bump. And they were very stiff in those days. So it used to smack onto the, onto the, onto the floor. My foot would sort of hit against the side. And it was excruciatingly painful. So I thought, well, I've got to get around this. Well, I was taking about 10 Nurofen at the time, completely loaded up with stuff every single day. So the only one I thought, well, how am I going to get around this one, especially for the, for the race itself? And I thought, right, well, I'll try one thing. And it was basically, when I came to the corner, I just relaxed my leg completely. When it hit the bump, it smacked on the side so hard, I screamed my head off, but it went over the pain threshold. So then after that, it was nowhere near as painful. So that allowed me to then, when I eventually got the race, Great race pace, got myself in, I think, fourth place quite early on. Alain Prost had problems, I think, with pit stops, so he didn't do so many. Guzman was, was behind him. I closed the gap for the last couple of laps and finished fourth, two seconds behind uh, Alain and sort of one behind Guzman. And it was just, for me, you know, in the personal way, so rawly em emotional just because the dream of, was to get there to go through what I'd gone through and beat my teammate and then get into fourth place. And the biggest thing with this was uh, Flavio Briatore was just coming into F1. Luciano Benetton was there. Aless Alessandro Nanini had obviously got out of the car after the race. By the time I'd got out of the car after beating the press and going back to the hospitality unit, they'd all pissed off. So it was the first sort of sign of y the support isn't really there. I only had Peter Collins at that point. And then the next race, was where I arrived at Imola, and we did the, the drivers meeting on the Sunday morning. And before everything started, it was uh, uh, Jean-Marie Balest who was sort of hosting it all for the FIA. And he basically said, and he was always funny with the way he said, he used to bang, bang the table, I don't know. He said, right everybody, listen to me. Uh, Donny, stand up. I'd stand up, you think, oh, you know, what the hell's going on now? So and he sort of said, drivers, this man has been through a lot. A lot. <laughs> no, and, he, and every Ayrton, Alan Pross, and everybody in the room clapped. And it was because of what Bales did. And it was a real nice, a nice thing for me to sort of have that. And it was just, and again, something else that sort of sticks in your mind that's just a, a wonderful moment. Well, it'd be lovely if the season continued in that way. Yeah. But it didn't. In fact, it went, it went downhill. Yeah. And in fact, um, although you got to that point, it wasn't easy. Uh, both mentally and, and physically. Mm. And um, over the next, uh, I mean, it went sour with, with, with Benetton, and uh, that was as good as it got for a while at least. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing, obviously, was my, well, the, the strength, mainly in the calf muscle for the braking, was, was not there. So I used to, do, I, used to I went to Monaco, I always remember, because I couldn't really 
put enough pressure on the brake. I, I only had about half the pressure I would, that needed just to get the things to sort of glow red, as we see in the modern, modern day cars. So the only way I tried to do it was to get the strength. I'd actually brake, because the monocots were quite big in those days, but I actually try and brake with my heel to get the pressure so it was direct then, sort of up my leg. But the consistency of that is just ridiculous. I'd probably get it right once in every five laps. So I was just suffering so, so, so much that the performances just really sagged off. We got to Canada, I didn't qualify, and that was my last, my last Grand Prix. So it was emotional. I remember when I got the phone call, it wasn't Flavio, because he didn't have the balls to call me. It was his secretary, and they said, we're gonna arrest you. Which resting, I don't know what resting ever meant in, at that point. And uh, that was sort of, I thought, that's it. That's sort of my career sort of did you think that's it? I did because yeah. I only had Peter. Peter had been sacked by that point anyway, so I had nobody there. I'm this cripple, effectively, that's been dropped by its team. And I look back now, and actually, I completely understand why. Um, but then I think, well, no one else is going <laughs> to is going to bother to yeah. to touch me. So that's when I went to Japan to sort of then try and get myself in the best condition I I could. F1 was still my my sort of dream. And in 1990, I was very fortunate in 1990 when I was racing sports cars and Formula Nippon in Japan, that Lotus, again, Peter War, I was the reserve driver. And then Martin Donnelly had his absolutely enormous crash in Jerez, and I did the last two races of, of 1990. So at least then, I was sort of back in the seat. And I did okay, I think, against Derek. I think Derek Warwick was my teammate at the point. I think the engine failed, the Lamborghini V12. And then Australia, I think we had a very similar thing. So, it, but at least I was there. And what was lucky for me, in 1991, after Lotus then uh, stopped, Peter Collins and Peter Wright, they took over Lotus, and that gave me my second my second chance. So you had a few years, the early 90s, Lotus Ligier, where, where you had drives, yep. uh, without necessarily, you know, uh, getting too much excitement out of it. But at least you were in Formula One until we get to to 95 with the unlikely return, return to Benetton. Um, I, I think at this point we, we, should, we can't gloss over what happened in 94, um, which was not relevant massively directly to you, but it was to the sport of Formula One. Yeah. And in one weekend in, in, in Imola, the sport, and it's never to be forgotten, also lost a good friend of yours, Roland Ratzenberger, yeah. but also Ayrton Senna. And it's interesting, I, I'm particularly interested to know your take on this because the Formula One drivers I've spoken to about the death of Senna, always see it as a, as a, as a, as a watershed moment in, in Formula One. The sport would never be the same again, and every driver's invincibi invincibility and immortality went through the window at, mm. at that point. But you'd already had as near as damn it a, a, a mm. death experience yourself, so, and, and you went on to be a pallbearer at, yeah. at the great man's funeral. Perhaps yeah. if you could explain a little bit about, about that experience, but also your take on, on what it did for the sport and for you. Yeah, well, for, for me, in my sort of weird, twisted way in many regards, is it, when, when it happened to Roland, it was, it was shocking because it was so sad. Roland, brilliant, lovely guy, had a, had a good amount of talent that was there that we never really saw because he was in the Simtech. <coughs> and then, the, obviously, the accident that he had in, uh, in qualifying where uh, we, we uh, sadly lost him. Um, and it was sad because it was his third Grand Prix, I think it was, second or third Grand Prix. And it was just sad that someone who had tried so desperately hard to get there made it. And again, a little bit like me, but in a slightly different way. And then it was all taken away from him like that, off from us. Because I think it was, he was a lovely guy, as I said before. <coughs> and it was just shocking the way that it sort of happened, where it happened, how it happened. And we were all sort of really emotional about it. I remember Ayrton actually going down to see what had happened down at that track. That's where Ayrton was very different to a, a lot of drivers. He went down, he spoke to Professor Sid Watkins, and they tried to discuss, you know, what's happened, why did it happen, everything else. He was always wanting to be involved, and he did that many times during his career before, before he died. But of course, then the following, the following day, again, it happens, it happens to Ayrton Senna. Ayrton Senna, you just did not give it any comprehension. I remember going past it, I remember him sort of a car going off and I remember him he, he hitting the bar and he was basically sort of ricocheting back onto the track by the time I'd got round. But the first thing you think is, oh, well, it's a big crash and he's going to be okay. And of course, then the red flag comes out. Uh, we stop on the, on the grid. 
we sort of don't really sort of know there's no information really going out the, the car is actually bought through the the middle of the grid i remember not with covers like they do nowadays and i remember there was a big split all the way down the side on the left hand side i think it was and uh no it'd be on the right hand side i think it was anyway so there was a big cut down there but the car was together so again you sort of think well he's okay he's not a not a problem and of course we we then get together there's a few rumors going around but nothing really happening but of course then the race is restarted so we all restart without knowing anything that's gone on and of course we do our race and then it's only when we stop that we're told that he, he sort of died on the way the way to hospital so it was just unbelievable because Rubens Barrichello had a big crash on the Saturday and then obviously then with Roland and then it, it just happened in this split moment that someone sort of just disappears but what's weird about it is for me it was something that I know what, how he loved it and I know how he loved to race on the edge I know his, his competition uh, perspective was always he wanted to race Alan or whoever it was he was racing for the for the championship Michael was probably the main man at that point and I was very similar because that was the risk that we knew was there and it was a, a risk we were all willing to take but that sort of as you say that did change the whole mentality of what Formula One was all about especially through Max Mosley I didn't agree with everything that we changed during that time but it did need to change because the way the cars were if you remember the monocots used to stop about here and there was no sort of protection from the driver's perspective which is eventually what we what we got to and, and very quickly you, you were Paul Bear as well at, at probably the biggest funeral you've, you've ever been to in, in your life. Yeah, and that was really, well I went to both, I went to Ayrton's and then I went to Roland's the following, the following day. So, and, what I, and why I did it, and there were drivers that couldn't, couldn't do it, and I did it because it was just showing respect for, for, for him. So it was nice that I know Jackie was there, I know Damon was there, uh, Emerson Fittipaldi and many, many others, Berger for example. Alan Prost, Alan was, Prost there. was there, yes yeah. exactly. So. And, 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 and rightly so, I think it was just that respect that we had to do. But actually, I remember landing and then driving into the centre of, uh, of uh, San Paolo and just seeing, seeing the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who turned up for this god, which he was in, it, it was in Brazil, and then of course then going the whole way through with the, uh, with the coffin itself, and then of course then actually when we laid it to rest, it was just a... Uh, just an awesome experience to have because it was just something you'd never ever ever thought would be mm. something you'd experience you know through someone who was you know who was he was a good friend you know we got on we got on for we used to pick you always used to pinch my bottom when we came out <laughs> of the, the driver's brief you know and when i had my crash and that's this is Ayrton as well i got a christmas card from him so just stuff like that it's not funny <laughs> but it's nice that was the the nice side of the man to happier times, yeah. 95, you end up back at Benetton. Uh, there's a certain Michael Schumacher who's the other driver, and mm. we'll get on to that in a moment. But suddenly, things are, things are looking up, and you know, it's going, well, it's not going that great, actually, to, to begin with. And then you arrive at, uh, at Silverstone. Sure, yeah. And everything changed. Yeah, everything changed. Uh, it was it was sad because '94 obviously is when Lotus sort of you know ended, and I left a little bit earlier. Did the last two races of '94 for, for for Benetton, and it was a point in my career where it was sort of, you know, it's Michael Schumacher. Uh, do I want to want to do that? But then I'm looking around at what other sort of options are there, and it's the best option that I'm going to have if I've got a chance of winning races and of course my dream of a world championship. But it's Michael. And more importantly, it's Flavio. Because <laughs> as I said, I go back to Rio. That's what I felt the first time I met him. He, he had sort of just dumped me. So, so there was he, he, him being sort of one worry, Michael being the other worry. But then when I had a meeting with Flavio, I remember at Enstone, he said, we're together, we're a team. Constructors is very important. We, we, we want you to be a part of that. And of course, I got to the second Grand Prix that year. And as we were walking to the car park with, with, uh, with my wife and with, with, with his wife, he sort of said to me, he said, Johnny, there's uh, things I'm sure you, you do that you don't want me to see. And there's things I do, you know, I don't want you to see. So I said, well, I said, that's what, you know, it's what it is. It's what the data's sort of all about to see. And I said, you know, that's the competition. So anyway, so we went back, went to the hotel, came back in the morning, and then uh, Ross Braun, 
uh, in the morning, sort of so I've just got something to say before we start the meeting, that Michael's had a word with Flavio about uh, you seeing his data. He doesn't want you to see his data, and Flavio has agreed, and I can't see uh, his data. He could see mine, but I couldn't see his. So That's your teammate, Michael. That's my teammate, Michael. And again, yes. that's what Michael's mentality was. And I, I look back now and I get it. It's He takes all the energy he possibly can from the team, from Flavio, from the, <laughs> the second driver to try and compete in the best possible way, which is what he did. And you, I can't say I, I'm pissed off with him. I'm pissed off with Flavio because it was Flavio who allowed it to happen when he gave me all this sort of yes, 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 yes. In my heart now, would I have beaten Michael? Probably not because I don't think this gave me exactly what I needed. I think it would have been way, way closer than what it was. But, you know, there were occasions, I think it's like, it was two seconds. And it was like, two seconds, where the hell is, how is it two seconds, two seconds off the pace? But that was a little bit, myself, was a little bit psychological as well. But I was very sort of alone in the team because there was no one really there to help me. Ross tried hard, but it wasn't enough. But of course, then you I decided, right, qualifying, I've got to forget. I've just got to concentrate on the, on the race pace and try and get the car the best possible feel that I can I can get from it, which then leads to Silverstone and Damon being a, a good old <laughs> friend, <laughs> taking out Michael. And then, of course, then I only realised, I think, when I got to, uh, to uh, Stowe that I was leading the race. I'd forgotten I was in third place, so it was a little bit later. And then I was lucky because DC had his uh, uh, pit lane speeding uh, penalty, and Ross told me, I think, about five laps before that I don't need to race DC. So, again, it just made my my race that little bit little bit easier so well i think you deserve a little bit of luck at, 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 I, yeah. at some point as as a as a racing driver i've always been told there are uh, as a british racing driver there are th if you could only win three grand prix one would be monaco one would be monza which we'll get onto in a second yeah and one would be the british grand prix if you can re win your first grand prix as a british racing driver it would be the british grand prix no it'd be it'd be japan it would be Japan. It yeah. would be yeah right. Yes, exactly. so no, you're, you're right. It's, it's, so your first, your it's first the place ever, that it was. Your first ever Grand Prix is the British Grand Prix. <laughs> yeah, that's not bad. No, nope. I have to say it was a brilliant experience. You know, you guys are there being fans and everything else, and some of you have been around for a long, long time, following us even from our Formula Four days. So to see the sea of people around the track, and it's all sort of waving flags at you was something that was was emotional for a, for a different uh, different reason, which was the last five laps, and I had to fiddle around a little bit with the pedals because my right toe always was very painful for the last 10 laps. But I had to sort of try and enjoy the experience, but not winning the British Grand Prix. That's the, that's the weird thing. First thing that came into my mind about being in that position was all the shit I had to go through to get to that point. That was all what was going through my mind. Once the flag dropped, then I could actually join the moment itself. But it was still nice because you're slowing down and all you guys are around the track waving everything else. So it was a double celebration in a way that I'd sort of fought so goddamn hard to sort of get there, get to that point, get myself in a position on the racetrack to sort of have a chance and then actually then achieve it. So it was a pretty there was a wonderful time. moment on, the, on the, you don't see this very often, a wonderful moment on the podium where DC and who's the other guy Alessi, on the podium? John Alessi. John Alessi yeah. hoisted Johnny up onto their shoulders. Now, can you imagine Lewis and Nico <laughs> doing that? <laughs> <laughs> but that's what they did. And that was, yeah. again, the spare your blushes. A, you're a pretty popular guy, but B, they knew, they also recognised a journey that got you to that point. Yeah, and again, with Jean, because we actually, we met when we were doing Formula 3 in the, the Monaco Formula 3 race that we had. He finished second, I finished third. And then we went together in Formula 3000 the, the, the following year. And then, of course, he won the 3000 title the next year. And then we know about what Jean, Jean Alessi uh, did or should have done as far as raw talent goes. But uh, so I think Jean was always, he's a very good, he jokes about it now, actually. He says, ah, he says, yes, uh, I still love my friend Greg L. Wojtek. <laughs> <laughs> So he's always taking the mickey out. So it's great because we can have a good old banter on the other way. And then DC, yes, equally so. He was a little bit behind me as far as racing was concerned. But there was, there was a nice, nice aura about me winning the race, yeah. except Flavia.
Yeah. <laughs> and, and just to show it wasn't a complete fluke, you followed that up by winning at Monza as well. Thank you, Damon, once again. <laughs> <laughs> a good friend he is. And he's always there. I'll tell you what's nice about him. I know he's mentioned it even in his book, where I think even in 99, he sort of mentions he had a problem with his Jordan. They should have done a better job than they did. But he said, after a horrible, sort of disappointing weekend I had, the one thing that sort of made him smile was me winning the race. And that's what Damon is all about. He's a bloody nice chap. He's a guy that is quite awkward with being a world champion like he is, which pisses me off no end. But <laughs> it's nice that still today with the stuff we do on Sky, we've got this real nice sort of chemistry with each other, which is, which is really nice. And there's a lot of respect which goes sort of both ways, of course, because he delivered. He doesn't get the cool credit he deserves, to be perfectly honest. Everyone says, oh, we had the best car, and that's why he won. And then I sort of go, Lewis Hamilton, that was probably the best car that the, they had. Michael Schumacher, yeah, he had the best car as well. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. And remember, he had to take over Williams after, after Ayrton had gone. Mm -hmm. So everything was just plonk on his shoulders, and he had to deal with it, and he was strong enough to do it. So 95 was a, was a season that uh, Michael Schumacher... So Monza was nice, yes. Monza yeah. was a nice, Monza another nice, nice victory, <laughs> yes. What people may forget is that Schumacher was world champion and the hero, yada, 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 sure. yada. But you finished fourth, mm -hmm. and more importantly, Benetton won the Constructors' Championship. Yeah. And without your um, not insignificant points tally, that wouldn't have happened. Yeah. So Flavia, whether he likes it or not, has got to thank you for that. He didn't like it. He didn't, he didn't like, like it. it. Okay. <laughs> yes, he didn't like it. And again, there was no sort of pat on the back or anything at the end of the season at all. It was just a very dismissive, rude almost, way that he sort of went about opening the door to let me go. He was, he was you know, even the Monza uh, uh, podium. And when I got up there, it was Micker and Heinz Held Frentzen. And when they give the Constructors' champ, uh, Cup, out first, so Flavio was there for that, of course, taking the glory. And then they gave him the, the, the trophy, and normally they just sort of hang around at the side. He just walked straight off and before they gave me the trophy on the podium. So again, it was just where he had had this awful mentality where he could only focus on one driver. And that was the biggest, biggest problem he had, biggest flaw that he had. And I'm glad today we see Nico and Lewis actually given the same sort of equipment. I know there's a lot of people sort of say yeah, it was a little bit against Lewis with the reliability, which is absolute uh, uh, rubbish. But it's they do give them an equal chance. And back then there was less, way less of that, and especially with the way Flavio did his working within the team. But then I look at it and say, well, actually, the, he got that success mm. with Benetton and Michael at the same time. So I just sadly I was on the sort of receiving end of the of the bad stuff. Do I do I think do I actually now go? Should I have done it? I would have done the same thing, to be honest, because I didn't have a choice. Or could you settle this? Because Flavio is here tonight. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, <laughs> Only joking. <laughs> Bring him in. <laughs> lock the doors. Lock Come the doors. On in. <laughs> so, sort of 90, uh, despite the highs of 95, actually, there were too many highs after that until we get up to, to 99. Your, your time at Benetton, your second time and final time came and went, mm. um, and then it, w it seemed to be going a little bit uh, as if the best times were over in your, in your career as an F1 driver, but there was one final almighty crescendo, and that was when you joined the fledgling uh, Stewart racing team, which of course meant that uh, uh, Jackie Stewart, who wasn't too shabby <laughs> as a driver, Not at all. became your boss, which I, I guess had lots of positives <laughs> And one or two negatives, not least the tars and trousers he used uh, to wear. For sure, yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, you got it. No, the, you know, the, the main thing is it was very similar, strangely enough, to Sergio Perez, where he went to McLaren and it all didn't really work out, and he had to rebuild his career, and he's done actually a very, very good job. And I was sort of in a similar thing, so going to Sauber after that was was sort of good for me. It was refreshing. It was a family family type of team. Heinz held Frentzen was there, so that was good to have Heinz, because actually Heinz was regarded better than Michael when they were racing in, the, in sports cars. Um, and then he got his chance at Williams, won one race, and then it sort of really sort of petered out. Very good at Jordan when he was going for the championship. Anyway, so it was good to be with, with, uh, with Heinz Harold. And, and you liked that family thing? You didn't well, like it, was important at that, but it was important at that time, because yes. I, I needed to have something and rebuild and have the confidence to get myself back. It was lovely winning the two races. It was wonderful finishing 
uh, fourth, but I know I, I knew I needed to sort of improve myself to sort of get myself, just personally, just mm. personally get myself in a better mental sort of situation. So it was good having, as I said, Peter Sauber was, was, was good and then it was good with Heinz. And I got, it was nice and competitive <coughs> with Heinz, which was good because as I said, the reputation he had. So that sort of helped me out. We had a good 97, we had some really good results. We should have done a little bit better sometimes, but the big thing, yes, was obviously at the end of 98, when I was teammate with John Alessi, that it wasn't quite working out. And then they approached me from, from Stuart Grand Prix and I thought, yeah, that's good. I had a relationship with Ford from, from the past. They were sort of wanting it to happen and it sort of just, it's like anything in life, it was timing. You know, there's a lot of things that happened before. Were they fair? No. Uh, was I unlucky? Yes. But that's just the way the ball sort of rolls or the cookie crumbles. So and it was yeah, a nice thing, opportunity to get The other thing it. we should say at this point as well is that you had this reputation, probably began with your get me the, uh, the, the, the backup car comments yeah. at Brands Hatch, to be a cheeky chappy, mm. bit of a joker. Yeah. And you knew, you knew that and uh, you used it as a, I suppose, a safety mechanism. Mm. But it, it, in some quarters it probably worked against you. Yeah. I was, when I was racing before I had the accident, I was, again, that shyness was always there, but the shyness was actually looked upon as being arrogant. But arrogant is very good and it's a powerful weapon. So even the teams and the drivers that I sort of didn't talk to so many, it was, I was arrogant, but, but my performances were great. So I was this sort of, this, I sort of put an aura out there, which was like, whoa, this guy's something special. Anyway, so that went on, then I had the accident and all the way, uh, all the way through the rest of that career, the only way I could get over it, especially when I was doing sort of the rehab to get back, and then also when I was when I actually raced in Rio, the only way I could get over it, the pain that I sort of had, was to laugh about it. Because if I laughed about it, at least for me, it was a way of relieving all the issues that I sort of had. Because I couldn't share it with anybody. I never even shared it with my wife with all the pain that I was having because I didn't want to worry her. I couldn't tell anybody in the paddock because any, if anybody had heard from a, from a team, they wouldn't have touched me with a barge pole. So, so I had to sort of deal with that f for one thing and the laughing and the joking helped me just move on and just keep on going. And every time I did it, yes, Ron Dennis, I went to see him once, I think after 95, I think it was. I remember walking through, the, through uh, into, the, into his office and the first things he said to me was, not good morning, how are you? How's the family? Lovely time, welcome to McLaren, lovely weather outside. It was, I need to change you. First thing he said, because of my bubbly, bubbly way, because he didn't think I was serious. But that was my, as you say, my mechanism, my protection of trying to deal with what I've got. So within that breath that he sort of said, I need, to, that was it, I thought, well, no, this ain't gonna work. So we left the factory and that was it. We never, we never got it together, but it sort of came better for me, of course, because it's sort of, it was just my only way of surviving, effectively. So it was tough, but again, it was, I had the gut desire to just keep on, keep on going. And as long as someone wanted me, then I had the opportunity to get some podiums for Salber, and then finally with Stuart, get my last, my last Grand Prix win. Well, Jackie wanted you. He was a little bit hands-on, wasn't he? But he did, he did know. <laughs> Perhaps give us a little bit of an example of, of what he thought about your driving. It's very aggressive. <laughs> You're very aggressive. You've got to be smooth with the car. You've got to treat it like a woman. <laughs> treat it smooth. And that was always his thing. Aggressive, aggressive, aggressive. And I remember we did a thing at uh, Alton Park. And it, would always, it was always very weird, really, because we went to Alton Park and he did it with every single driver, DC, Dario Franchitti. The only man who didn't get there, actually, was Jos Verstappen. Hey, that boy would never drive for me ever again. <laughs> and he stuck to his word. <laughs> and that was it. So we got there and it was a uh, World Rally Escort around Alton Park. So I, I went around the track and everything else and he's, yeah, you're, you're still aggressive, you've got to be smooth with the steering wheel, let the car drift, let the car move, be smooth and everything else. So anyway, so then after, the, I don't know, 10 laps or so, he had a go in the car and he was rough as nails. He was all <laughs> over the curves and everything else. And it was, I just looked at him and I just shook my head. Didn't say a word and that, and that was it. But again, Jackie, you know, three-time world champion, as brilliant as he is, was a businessman at the same time. 
we, we, we'd go testing and he'd always stick his head in. He was always out on the track watching, trying to sort of help you. It was always that same, same words that ever, always came out about being smooth. But he was still that racing driver that still wanted to be part of it. He still wanted to be sort of in the cockpit with you from that point of view. So as much as he was trying to help, as much as he had that sort of little exit that came out, he was a good guy to work for. Did you crash with, or crash, but go off once and had that awkward moment? I was you hoping just... you wasn't going to bring that one up. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, it was, it, it, I was very unlucky, very unlucky. It was the way the wind was blowing. Are you, so. you were being too aggressive, so We were probably. going to, uh, well, I definitely was aggressive, yeah. yeah. Well, it was going into, uh, uh, oh, God, I forgot what the name is, the back straight. Uh, last corner, who knows Alton Park? Oh. No, that's the first one. Cascades. Ca no, it's after Cascades. The right hander, then it dips down, and you go in the pits. I've gone with it's called Lodge. Come back to us, come back to us. It's Lodge, isn't it? Lodge, I'm at the wrong track. Anyway, whatever it is, it's the last corner. So as we're coming out, it's the first lap, it's a little bit damp, so the leaves are sort of on the circuit as well. So I sort of come into Lodge, I'm sorry it's not Lodge, but I came into the corner. So I went through the gears, give it a that. It's the clutch, the clutch wasn't quite sort of um, in the right sort of place. I didn't quite blip it as I should have done. It all locked up. It then went sideways. I always remember looking out the window, the barrels is going, <laughs> <laughs> I've got even three time world champion sort of next to me, team owner. And luckily, that didn't hit the barriers, it went ch -ch 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 in the gravel. And I remember he just sort of went, Right, Johnny, we better get it out to the gravel now. <laughs> and I am still convinced, I think I mentioned it in there, I'm sure there was a stain. <laughs> <laughs> well, Which I do. I from you or him? No, from him. Oh, no, from him. Right. No, from <laughs> him. No. So I think that I'm sure there was. An, I'm sure they got. And we got out. I remember him getting out, and we sort of went. <laughs> now, very much. Anyway, sorry. Yes, that was. Yeah. A happy, a happy sorry, time. Jackie. A happier sorry, time yeah. with Jackie Stewart. Yeah. Was the uh, the Nurburgring, the European Grand Prix, and your third and final Grand Prix victory, and the first for for Stewart Racing. The only one. Yeah. It was. Again, bit of a difficult year. We had a lot of reliability sort of issues that Rubens was driving really, really well sort of that year. And when we got to Nürburgring, um, always liked the track. It was always a track I sort of had, had done well, at, well up in the past. So it was always important to try and get ahead of your teammate for qualifying, which I was able to do there. I was 14th and 15th, I think we were. And then I always, re always remember, and it's one of these things that as a driver, you've got to take everything on board, what's going on around you. And when we sat on the grid, it was quite windy. A lot of cloud in, in, in the sky, as there always is in Nürburgring. But the wind was blowing directly up the straight, and about 30 kilometres uh, ahead is Spa. So you always generally know if it's cloudy like that, there's rain in the air. There was a lot of talk about it. We didn't really have the radar that we have sort of in the, in the modern, modern era. So I remember the wind. Uh, the race started off, got a good start. Everything was doing OK at that point. Then as I was going down the far end, I was remember looking out, and there was this, it was like a, a raindrop, but it was coming directly from Spa. It just keep coming every lap I went round. There it was, it was still straight, keep on going round, yeah, it's straight, straight, straight. And it was just sort of almost getting bigger and bigger and bigger as it got closer. And I'd been watching it, as I said. I was on my in-lap, uh, which was fortunate in a way, but because I'd sort of watched the way it had come across, it started to, to rain and I thought, well, that's gonna absolutely lash down and just soak the whole goddamn thing. So I got to the pits and I said wet, just as I was coming in the pit lane. So it was a big scrabble to change because they wanted to put slicks on. So we changed to the wets, went out, and it just bucketed it down, absolutely threw it down. Rubens come in the following lap, put slicks on. I was about, I don't know, 12, 14, 15 seconds quicker than the majority of people. I don't think there was many who put the wets on. And of course that just put me right up the, the sharp end. And just purely because of that, that gave me the chance to be behind, I think it was Ralph Schumacher in the Williams at that point who was leading, then he got a puncher. And then I was in the lead, I think Fizzy Keller had sort of whizzed off the track somewhere and I was leading the sort of the, uh, the, uh, the European Grand Prix as it was. But it was just purely because I'd watched the cloud. And it was one of those lovely experiences knowing I'd sort of done the right choice of tyre at the same time and then to actually win that race, but more importantly, in you know, the Stuart Grand Prix car, privateer, okay, back in from forward and everything else. He'd already sold it to Jaguar at that point. But it was still an amazing moment seeing the guys hanging over. I even remember sort of seeing the cap of Jackie sort of hanging over the pit wall as well. And it was just something that was 
unexpected for one, which was really, really nice. But to achieve it, it was, it, it was nice because at least I had made quite a, an important call which allowed it to happen. No, we, we got real good show for the fans. There's all the scrutineering going on down there. There's a driver parade and of course then the cars get onto the track. But from a driver's perspective, and more importantly for me, the most important thing about that was was proving to the rest of the sort of the motorsport world that these things were actually in good shape. You've got to test it to the absolute max, and then that's what Le Mans is able to do. Formula One is the toughest; it's the the, the the top of the top of the tree as far as performances goes. But it's only for that sort of hour and a half, hour or forty minutes. So Le Mans was a very important thing to do. The Mazda wasn't the most competitive car. But it, we knew it was very, very reliable. There was myself, Volker Weidler and Bertrand Gasho. We'd all sort of done Formula One. Myself and Bertrand were still doing it, I think, at that, that point. He hadn't gone to prison. And it was an important race, as I said, for me to try and just prove to the world. But the biggest thing was, obviously, the reliability of the car was just so, so good. The Mercedes, we knew, was always going to be very, very quick. We knew we'd be sort of competitive against the Jags, but we, it's probably the very first time at Le Mans where the drivers were told to push, 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 push. No ease up the whole way through, which is what you get in the modern day Le Mans. And the way that the car <coughs> responded during the race, for us, it just the drivability was, was lovely. So we just kept pushing. I think we were a lap, lap and a half down on the Mercedes, but we just knew if we just kept putting pressure on, you never know what can happen because that's what Le Mans does, you know, Toyota should have won this year, but it stopped on the last lap. That's the cruel side of what Le Mans can do. And then of course the, um, <coughs> the belt on the oil pump and the Merck stopped, well, it broke. So it stopped the car, they get in the pits. We led for about the last four hours, three hours, four hours, I can't remember what it was exactly. And then we just took this sort of brilliant win in a, in a very bright, sort of orange car with the Wankel engine with a six foot flame that used to sort of come out the side and this screaming, you know, three rotor engine that just everybody actually loved. They just loved the look at it. The aesthetics of it were just something they really did enjoy. But so to it's win right it, up there. it's right up there. It's right up there. The only thing that's not right up there was me on the podium because I collapsed down the bottom and I never actually got to the podium because I was only living on uh, pot noodles. Because I used to get so, so nervous, that was the only thing I, I could eat. But again, it's just a really special race to have won and still to be the only, which I'm still amazed, the only Japanese manufacturer to win it. It's just that little bit extra special still today. Okay, three quick things to, to, to finish with. Uh, number one is, this is a question that every uh, Formula One driver is asked. Really need to hear your take on this. Who is the greatest? Well, Schumacher is the statistically the greatest. Uh, some people will argue the Fangios of the world, who didn't even have seatbelts for goodness mm. sake, um, were the greatest. Some will say Senna, not statistically, but he was the greatest. You're a big Jim Clark mm. fan as well. Yep. I mean, it's an impossible question to answer, but answer it anyway. Well, I'll answer it. I think uh, the, 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 the most impressive driver I think I've seen out there through everything that, that he did through his whole, whole career is myself. Um, <laughs> well, I think it is, I think it is, yeah. The Fair fastest enough. cripple in the world. Yeah. No, I think with everything I've, with everybody I've seen, you said you said about Jimmy, I never saw him race unfortunately, I've only seen what I've seen on TV. But the man that always just gave me a sense, raced him a little bit in karting, obviously he went through to, to win his, his uh, world championships, was just the way Ayrton went about his racing. He was just so... It's very similar. Lewis copies him. He's got his same sort of mentality. He was blinkered. He wasn't understood by the press very much because he was sort of the first one that really sort of went into the little bubble of really getting the best out of the team, out of the car and everything else that, that he needed to, to do to get the performances that he got. But his qualifying was sublime. He was always the last man on track and he pretty much always nailed it when he did that. And then when it came down to the racing, we always know he was very quick if it was wet or dry, probably more impressive when it, when it was wet. And then it was his ability with the race craft. I know we can go to Suzuka and go through all that sort of palaver that happened there. Um, and I think it's just, it, there was just something about him. He had this sort of aura around him. Even Nigel Mansell, well, to be honest, if he walked in here, there's a massive aura that, that Nigel carries. Ayrton was exactly the same. And that's something that we haven't seen for quite a long time. You do Michael, Michael did what he did. 
Damon Hill should have won the 1994 World Championship, but he took him out. He tried to do the same thing with Villeneuve in 97. He did his parking sort of uh, thing in, in Monaco, trying to stop Fernando Alonso. That's just, I know it's horrible with his situation that he's got, but that was just the little bits that weren't what I thought racing was all about. You were there to win it fair and square. But then you go, what Michael achieved was immense. But it was just the way that he did it, and I always thought Ayrton was just that little, little bit more special. This season looks like it's Nico's. Yeah. Uh, Lewis could have, maybe should have won it. Been a bit unlucky, maybe brought some of it upon himself. How do you see the final two races going in the season and your sort of wrap up of the season? Yeah. Well, Lewis, yes, he has been unlucky. Uh, has it been fair? No. I look at myself, my crash, Gregor Wojtek. Parking maybe like that didn't really help there. Was it fair? No, life's not fair. You guys, you know, there are things that happen in life that aren't easy. You've got to deal with it and you've got to try and get through life in, in maybe a different way for whatever reason that, that may be. And this season has been just one of those where it's he's been the quickest driver out. He's the quick, for me, he's the quickest driver out on the track uh, by, by a mile. But he's had a little bit of unreliability. There has been the start issues that have come along. Can you blame him? I think that's still do, to do with the Mercedes itself, where it's the system. It's not a driver's thing, it's a system that they have to try and do. Nico has done probably a better job with it for whatever reason. Maybe he's worked harder at trying to get it done. I know Lewis has been to the factory to sort it out with his start engineer. The last three starts have actually been pretty good. Nico has done a good job. He's been consistent the whole way through. Yes, he hasn't had as many issues that, that Lewis has had, but he's been solid. Does he deserve it? Personally, I think he does. You know, he's, he's not as quick as Lewis. He can be. He has beaten him fair and square before, so it's not as if it's just he's been lucky sometimes. If there was a race like this, which one would, would win? It would be Lewis, because Lewis is the one who always does the overtaking moves. And we're going down to, to Brazil. Lewis hasn't won in Brazil yet. Nico has. Will that turn around? Probably, because I think Lewis is driving in a very, very good place at the moment. He's got a chance. I thought after the performances we've seen the last couple of years in Austin, he's been very, very good. Lewis dominated. Nico was very good in Mexico last year. This year he wasn't. So actually we're going to a race where we don't know. I reckon Lewis will win it. But I think the championship will go to, to Nico. I think he will just have enough to get over that line and actually win it. OK, finally, finally, let's just return to the book. OK, you've, um, I mean, you're very open, as you've been tonight as well, very honest and frank. Um, and the book is a very uh, honest, honest read. Was it, mm. was it a cathartic experience, in a sense, when you wrote it? Did you actually discover a few things about yourself which came out uh, into the book? And, and really, sort of, to, to, to sum up, a lot of people describe you as, as Britain's lost world champion because you, you had it all, you were going to win world titles and then predominantly the injury and mm. other bits of bad luck stopped you. Flip side of that is your career was not exactly shabby. No. Uh, you won lots of things. You were alive, for goodness sake. Yeah. So all in all, unlucky, lucky, cathartic experience? Yeah, I think, I think lucky, unlucky. As I said to you before, that's the way sort of life is. I, I can sort of vaguely remember what it was like before where it was just pure natural ability that just seemed to be sort of oozing out of my body. I never used to have to think about it. I never had to work at it. It just seemed to sort of happen, which is what I always see with Max Verstappen and sort of Lewis, for example. I, I like getting into the car with them just to feel what's going on and that's what I sort of enjoy doing the job that I'm doing at the moment. I think the only thing I look back at, back at it sometimes and a lot of the time actually now is how the fuck I did it to be honest excuse the fruit swearing how the hell did I do it because I look back when a guy has a cold now and they have an off weekend I wish I had a bloody cold every single Grand Prix that I did but I'm glad I stuck to my guns and I'm glad I worked as hard as I did to get the chances that I got I was very fortunate yes to get those those three wins but I've worked damn hard at getting myself in, in that position. So I've been a very lucky boy from, from that perspective. When I come back in my next life, 
V's are going on the end of Lewis Hamilton's legs, <laughs> and I'm going to have his, <laughs> and I'm going to beat his record wherever he sets. All right, well, look, you're gonna, it's going to be a little bit of a book signing, so if you've got a, a quick question, I'm sure you can throw that in whilst Johnny's doing uh, his, his signing at, at the front of the, uh, the store. So uh, I think we've been chatting for quite long enough. Uh, I'm sure at this point you'd all like to show your appreciation for Mr Johnny Herbert. Thank you.